Late DA Richard Brown's legacy is one of a hard-charging, tough-on-crime prosecutor. Queens is the most punitive borough. The district attorney's office sends more offenders to jail on misdemeanor cases than any other New York City DA. <coughs> would you continue that stance or change it, and if so, how? I would change it. Um, it, it is amazing how many people can go into diversion programs and actually be helped. No one is getting better by spending a year on Rikers Island. We need to shut that down. But we really need to make sure that people don't end up on Rikers Island. So you need diversion programs from the very beginning. Right now it's being done in several of the boroughs in, the, in Brooklyn, in Manhattan, and in Staten Island, where they're diverting a lot of the crimes so that people don't end up with a record. And instead, they end up in drug rehabilitation programs, and mental health illness programs, in cure violence programs, and they have supervised release. So people are actually watching to make sure that they are benefiting from this release. So what kinds of crimes would get diverted and ones, what, which ones wouldn't? We need to make sure we look at a case-by-case -case basis, but we're not going to prosecute for marijuana. That's already done in my office on January 1st. We're not going to make, we're going to make sure that a lot of the low-level misdemeanors that people are getting arrested for are going to be diverted into these programs. And one of the benefits I bring to this office is that I've spent a career working with a lot of the organizations from every part of the borough going neighborhood by neighborhood, earning the trust and the faith of the community leaders, the community organizations. And on January 1st, for a new district attorney to come in, like you said, Judge Brown has been there for 28 years. If you don't have the trust and the faith of the organizations, and then you don't have a process by which you bring in the judges and you bring in the criminal defense bar, you're not going to be able to institute criminal justice reform on day one. And that's what you want to do, day one? On day one, you need to be able to work after the primary for several months on a transition to make sure that we have a system in place that we're not prosecuting for a lot of these low-level crimes, but instead of sending people to Rikers Island and instead of sitting in the day room where there is an institutional uh, violent problem, where there are drug issues, where there's issues like that on Rikers, we need to make sure that we are lowering recidivism when it comes to crime. And the way to do that is to divert many of the young people especially into these cure violence programs and do that throughout the entire Borough of Queens. But again, you can't start that from the beginning. And if you need to introduce yourself, it's a real problem to get the trust and the faith of the system which you're going to need. So what's your position on prosecuting so-called broken windows crimes? public urination, torn style jumping, things like that. We're not going to prosecute for those, but we will make sure that people who do get picked up for that are going to get the help that they need. For instance, a lot of the toll jumping, which is um, actually effectuated through the MTA court, but a lot of the toll jumpers can't afford to be able to pay for the subways. And we need to make sure that we, we have a card available for them that is lower cost. And that's in the process now, and that's a good thing. And a lot of the lower stuff, level... You want a lower price card for people so, who can't afford it. Yeah, there is a large movement in the city, which I agree with, which is the fair fare, which is to be able to get a metro card for a lower price if you can show the need. So that you're not jumping the turnstile because you can't get your kids to school, or you can't get to your job, or you can't get to a lot of the services that are available, especially for those in the diversion programs. So the next question, the use of recreational marijuana is still illegal in New York. Are there any marijuana prosecutions that you would undertake? I will not prosecute for low-level marijuana. And in fact, we're going to go back and look at the people sitting on Rikers Island because they were picked up for low-level marijuana. It inordinately is uh, going after people of color. And I believe that the arrests for marijuana is an excuse quite often for stop and frisk. You know, seven years ago, we all stood together and said stop and frisk. 98% were people of color. 91% had nothing on them, not even a, a nail clipper, nothing. And yet, we still are doing it for marijuana arrests. So we have to stop prosecuting for them. And we need to look back with the power of the office to ones that are sitting in Rikers because of it. Well, what about the sale of marijuana near a school or sale to minors? So we don't want people selling marijuana in the streets. We want to make sure that we are uh, getting the help that they need in order to get out of that business and making sure that we don't allow that, especially near our schools. But again, it's you know the, going after the people that are actually utilizing it is not helping anyone. We need to make sure that that's not being done and that the inequities of the past are made up for. So the new bail statute does not allow someone to be held pre-trial for misdemeanor assault, mm -hmm. even those, uh, though this is frequently the initial charge in a domestic violence case. 
Do you support this change in the law, and how will it affect domestic violence prosecutions if you were the DA? I do support no cash bail, and I think, though, for domestic violence and many other, by the way, types of crimes where there might be a danger to the individual, you need to have supervised release. You need to have a way of monitoring. You need to make sure that they are checking in Even every domestic day. violence cases? So I it is the law starting on January 1st that for misdemeanor nonviolent felons, and so the violence would be uh, categorical. And we need to make sure that we are following the laws that we have in the state of New York. But that doesn't mean that you can't have supervised. It doesn't mean that you can't make sure you're getting them help, especially from the people who are the victims of domestic violence. We need to make sure that we're protecting the victims, taking them out of their situation. And in Queens, we also need to make sure that people are uh, reporting these crimes, even if they have status issues with their documentation. That is a huge issue in the borough of Queens, where 68,000 of our children are living in mixed status households. And a lot of women and a lot of victims don't want to come forward because they're afraid of what's going to happen with deportation. And so you want to make sure that you create an atmosphere where there is a comfort level in coming in, reporting the crime, and knowing that you're going to get the help and not lose the person uh, by deportation consequences. So should sex workers be prosecuted? And what about people who own buildings where some of this activity is taking place? So sex workers, we are not going to prosecute for sex workers. Instead, we're going to divert that, that fund to make sure that we get the traffickers. There are women all over the world and people all over the world who are being fooled into coming to this country for other jobs or because of other reasons. And then they get here and they are held as sex workers. And we want to make sure that the funds that we use are diverted into actually getting those folks who are creating that, who are making sure that the women or the, the victims do not report it. And a lot of that has to do also with deportation issues. You want to make sure that they are comfortable coming in. But Truthfully, we want to start by making sure that they have the resources they need and that are available to them before they even end up in that situation so that they know they have a place to go. Would you have prosecuted Patriots owner Robert Kraft and the others who were nabbed in that Florida massage parlor case? You mean the Johns? Yeah. So, John, I think you have to take I mean, it. Robert Kraft was nailed because he was getting serviced at the, uh, right. at the, I forget the name of the massage parlor. I do think you have to take the, the people who are getting the services on a case-by-case -case basis. In general, I think you have to look at how that's being done, where that's being done, and to whom they are using. Um, but you're, you're not going to be able to say that you'll never prosecute Johns. You're also not going to be able to say that you will always do it. But I do think it's a case-by-case -case basis. And in general, you have to make sure that there's not a market there for them as well. And as soon as, soon as there is more of a market, like with Johns, it's going to be hard to go after the sex traffickers. Next, Richard Brown was a tough, tough prosecutor. And I wonder if you think there should be a review of all the sentences of people over 30. You know, would you recommend reductions? And if so, for what? We need a conviction integrity unit for everyone. A conviction integrity unit has been shown time and time again to get people released who just were wrongfully convicted. They were either wrongfully convicted, the DNA evidence, technology has caught up with them, or whatever the reason is, they are still uh, insisting on their innocence, either by emotion or through their lawyers. You absolutely need a conviction integrity unit. The key is not having one because that's an absolute. The key is how you set a conviction integrity unit up. It has to be accountable. It has to have people on it that are ADAs, which are not the ones who did the original prosecution. We need to make sure that we have the criminal defense bar that is involved in the conviction integrity unit. We also need to make sure that you have people from the community on that unit. You know, in Queens, it's very interesting. You can walk across the street and be in a totally different culture, totally different neighborhood, totally different country. And every neighborhood in Queens County has its own diversity, its own uh, culture. And to have people on that conviction integrity unit that understand the cultures in the borough, I think is extremely important. But yes, every time you get a new executive into office, including the district attorney, there's different policies and programs that that person has. I would like to look back at the old cases. Well, the reason I asked the question, like what, would you, like what cases would you recommend? I mean, would you look at people who were in jail for long term as for, drug use, for selling drugs and say maybe that's outdated? So first, you want to make sure that you look at all the old cases where they were arrested for marijuana and convicted for marijuana and small amounts of it. And you want to make sure that we get them out. They're taking up space. They're taking up uh, room. They would be better off in a drug rehabilitation program. You want to look back at all those cases that say that the DNA uh, will prove that they are innocent. And now the DNA has caught up with the technology. And so we want to make sure that we review all of those cases. But you also want to review the cases where they say time and time again and make good arguments 
that either they didn't have the evidence available to them, the evidence wasn't shown to the, their defense attorney, to make sure that they were not unfairly prosecuted, or one, once and for all, they simply didn't do it. But that's why you need a conviction integrity unit that has all of this expertise sitting on it to vet out the cases. But it's important, I can't imagine sitting in jail knowing that I didn't do something and that I was convicted and I had nowhere to turn, no one to turn to and no one who would listen. And for that alone, we need to have a conviction integrity unit. Discovery laws were recently changed. What's your position on the requirement that witnesses to crimes have their identities provided to the defendants before trial? What steps would you take to protect the witness from pretrial intimidation? There are cases of, of random crimes, rape, murder, all that happen, where you need to make sure that the witnesses and the defendants and, and the victims' names are not released. You also need to make sure that with um, uh, when, when there is cases like that, that you're actually reviewing the evidence very well, that there's no distinguishing factors so that you could identify the person. That is the law that's coming in on January 1st, which is discovery reform. So you need to make sure you have a district attorney that has a system in place where we're not handing over private information or identifying information, and that you redact that from the very beginning. And that is the, the real issue when it comes to uh, a trial. You know, a lot of times in Queens, you don't get the evidence that's against you until right before trial, which means that your plea bargaining, your, the criminal defense attorney doesn't have a chance to build their defense because they simply don't know the evidence that's against them. And you need to balance the safety of the witnesses and the defendants with the information that so you provide. So how do you protect the witnesses? Like I said, you can redact the information when you hand it over to the criminal defense. Okay. Would you actively investigate cases of tenant harassment? Yes, so we uh, months ago uh, came with a position paper on the Bureau of Housing Fraud and Landlord and uh, Tenant Protection. So I absolutely would do that. And as the borough president, I've seen a lot of predatory lending, a lot of landlord abuse, a lot of things that need to be dealt with at the DA's office. And that's why I'm one of the few, I think I'm the only candidate, uh, who actually put a position paper out on it already. And we need to make sure that we hold people accountable. White collar criminals need to be as accountable as anyone else. And the amount of money they have or the type of crime shouldn't matter. We were decimated in the borough of Queens about 10 years ago by predatory lending and housing fraud. And there is no way to track it. So when you're a district attorney who believes that the conviction rate that they have is their sense of success, then you're not really going after housing fraud because it's very hard to get a conviction. And so you need to make sure that we are going to have a hotline in the district attorney's office so that people can call when someone approaches them at their house or by phone. And what happens is the contracts may be totally legal, but what they're saying to you isn't. And what they're saying to you is you can buy back your house at any time or you're going to be back on your feet in, t in a year from now. The interest rate's going to go up. But if you don't have a system where you have a hotline, where you have education in the community, and where you have investigators empowered to be able to go out and investigate it, and even if they don't get a conviction, I will tell you this, that white collar criminal is not coming back into that neighborhood ever again. So how would you handle requests from ICE? So ICE needs to be out of our courtrooms, it needs to be out of our schools, it needs to be out of our hospitals. In the Borough of Queens, we have had enormous issues with ICE, just showing up at our courthouses. You know, the sex trafficking is the perfect example. We have a human intervention, um, a sex trafficking intervention court. And ICE agents were literally standing outside to double victimize these people who were um, not only sex trafficked, but now they're coming out and getting arrested by ICE. So we can't be working with them to get those, uh, those folks. Um, and they need to be kept out. And we've been very clear on this as the borough president. With so many different countries, 190 countries and 200 languages, um, we have had enormous issues with ICE. And so we would, we would make sure they stay out. So how would, should Rikers Island be closed? Rikers Island is inhumane. It has a culture of violence. It has a culture of drugs. It is absolutely an institution that needs to be closed. My problem with the mayor's plan is that you're replacing one bad institution, which has proven to be inhumane, with four bad institutions, which are going to be set out across the city of New York, except for Staten Island. So the one in Queens County is supposed to be 1,500 beds. So here we have, have Rikers Island with almost 8,000 people in it. We're not, we, we need to lower the population. We need to make sure that people are getting the services they need. 
we need to make sure that the original plan, which was to lower the population, is actually effectuated. But then we need to make sure that we don't have an institution that's just as big, just as bad, spread out throughout the four boroughs. You know, I met with, um, I met with about 30 women um, about a few months ago now who were either just out of Rikers or were on work, um, on work release. And the, 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 the things that they described at Rikers, the inhumane treatment, the fact that you can't get mental health services in that day room, the fact that it's simply not structured for rehabilitation. It is structured simply to put people away and make sure that they just stay away. And they get out of Rikers, and the culture that is there is infested. And so we need to make sure that we are helping folks. I don't believe in replacing one big bad institution with four big ones. So what's the solution for Queens? So I, I do have, I do believe in community jails that are smaller and that can offer the services that we need. I also think that once the new laws go into effect and once I become the district attorney, we will have a lower population that actually belong from Queens. And so if you have a smaller type of system, which is still allowing the services to be gotten by the people that are in there, I think that is a better solution. But Rikers is not doing the job it's supposed to do. So the jail they want to build in Queens is a, is a tall something. 20 it's a 27 story institution which holds 1,500 people. And you know what I've learned as the land use chair of the city council? And you know what I've learned over my 25 years of experience in public and in private service? If you build an institution of 1,500 people, the one thing the city's going to have to do is fill it up. And you're not going to lower the population that's actually serving time. So yes, I am the Queensboro president, so in that capacity, I will vote on um, the present plan that the mayor has. I've already made it very clear I'm going to vote no on that plan, and I would vote no on any plan that provides 1,500 beds throughout any place in the borough of Queens. So what kind of a jail would you like to see put in Queens? We need a smaller one. We need one that shows that we're actually serious about lowering mass incarceration and lowering the people that we have in our community jails. We need to make sure that we have the services there for mental health illness, for drug rehab, for all of the things that people need in order to have workforce development. But you need a smaller institution. You need one that's more based on help and rehabilitation. And we need to make sure that it's not 1,500. N the numbers don't add up. Well, what's looks, the right number? I don't know the right number, but it's certainly not just replacing the exact 8,000 people that were in Rikers now and then spreading them out throughout the borough. The whole plan of this thing, the whole original plan, was to lower the population. Originally, they were supposed to use the detention center, which is right next door to the jailhouse. And it's already built. It's already there. It already has places inside. It could be you know, done from the inside out and be rehabilitated right where it stands. But that's not the plan that's in front of us. So as the new district attorney, we'll work with the city, we'll work with the community. But whatever it is, it has to come from inside the community as well. And they have to be part of the discussion. And part of the biggest problem with this plan is that in all four boroughs, um, Ruben Diaz and I have talked quite often, and he's actually on the same page. You get to talk to the people that are in the communities as well. And I don't just mean the community where the jail is going to go. I mean borough-wide. I guess the question I have is if you don't want to have a 1,500-person jail and you need to build another jail in, in, in Queens, are you not saying then, as DA, I'm going to make sure I don't arrest people so that they won't fill the jail so we won't need a bigger jail? No, as a district attorney, I'm not arresting you for most minor crimes. I'm going to make sure that the courts are cleared up to be able to take on very serious violent crimes, to make sure that we are uh, prosecuting those that deserve to be prosecuted for economic injustices. But if you don't start doing that from the very beginning and start clearing up the court, it is overworked. It takes too much time to get through the system. People are sitting in jail because of the many, many cases that the court system has right now, and they cannot process them fast enough. So what kind of a jail would you want to see in Queens? Would it be the same location? Would it be someplace else? Would it be in a different community? We need to work with the community, which hasn't been done yet. And that's really my biggest issue with this. You want to lower the population at Rikers. The numbers don't add up of lowering the population at Rikers. You're not going to need 1,500 beds. If what we're doing is making sure that the community jails are near people, who have an infrastructure of support from their family, from their wives, from their children, from their husbands, whatever it is, from their partners, and you're not being able to do that with the jail that is now being um, put through the system. So as the borough president, I'll vote no on it. I will vote no on any 1500 jail. Um, and we need to make sure that we involve the community from the very beginning of placing this. And by the way, we also need to include the groups that work with our young people and with our folks for workforce development and cure violence. 
they have not been part of this conversation at all. And if the whole point is to make sure that people are ready to come out and be part of the community, get a job, raise their families, go to school, then you need to have those discussions as well.